Chinmay Raj. I'm from, I'm, I just started my PhD uh, program at Georgia Tech. This work is my master's thesis work that I carried out at uh, NASA Ames before I started at uh, Georgia Tech. Uh, this is a real-time autonomous uh, instrumentation for lab-based micro experimental evolution. So basically, extremophiles have somehow adapted to learn, in un uh, to, learn to live in uncomfortable environments. It might be extreme temperatures, it might be extreme amounts of salts, it might be extreme acids, uh, acidic environments, extremely basic environments, and lack of oxygen. No matter what you think, they, they have learned to live in those environments through natural selection. Natural selection is a process of adaptation of an organism to its environment by selectively passing on the changes in its genetic constitution. Experimental evolution that we are interested in is a process of mimicking natural selection artificially by the process of exposing microbial community to intentional stressors to improve the resistance through uh, artificial mutation. Basically, experimental evolution is forced natural selection using lab-based procedures. How do you carry out uh, experimental procedures? Basically, you just grow microbes, you subject them to a stressor that you're interested in, remove unfit microbes, and you retrain the process. And at some nth iteration, you have a microbial colony that has adapted to your stress, despite having no uh, information as to how to do it initially in the initial stages. So the proof of experimental evolution is this data. Basically, uh, they use, uh, we use E. coli microbes for, by exposing them to 40 seconds and 60 seconds of UVC exposure, which is supposed to kill them, but they actually learn to grow despite the UV stresses. And in the seventh iteration, they had almost 10 to the power six uh, factors of increase in the growth rate. So this is proof that experimental evolution actually works, and this is proof that lab in the lab, a natural uh, environment can be created, and this can be made to work. This, is, uh, this work is a black box approach. I'm an instrumentation engineer, and I learned biology for the, pro for the part of this project. So basically, it's a black box approach. We have a microbe, that's radiation, by the way. We're, we're, exposing, <laughs> we're exposing them to radiation, and it's learning to grow stronger and robust despite the radiation. We are not focusing on what is happening to the DNA when this process is happening. And this is a black box approach. We are not interested in what's happening here. We just care that this is happening, and we just care about producing an instrumentation technique that can allow this to happen in a lab environment. The problem with manual uh, experimental evolution processes is that it's tedious, it's extremely time consuming, it's highly prone to human errors, uh, it's, it has high reproducibility and repeatability issues, and that affects your moods. Uh, and also, it, it kind of hurts that a one-cell organism dictates a multicellular magnificent organism such as ourselves mm -hmm. in the lab. It's not supposed to dictate our schedule. So what do we do? We automate the process. So this was the first generation device that was uh, designed at NASA Ames. It had four subcomponents. It had sensors, environmental controls, fluidic systems, and data storage using Arduino. So that's how it looked, and yes, I repaired it when I started at NASA Ames. Uh, it had set temperature sensing and optical density, which was done automatically. Uh, e. coli likes to grow in 37 degrees Celsius, so it had that kind of sensing. UVC system was the stressor that was used, and temperature also could be used because it was also a sensing parameter. Uh, the fluidic system included a one-chamber growth. This is a one-chamber growth, one growth uh, chamber. It had peristatic pumps for inletting fluids, inletting the nutrients continuously, and it had agitation because E. coli tends to stick to the walls, and that messes with the optical density, and we didn't like that. So agitated magnetically, so the cells are in, uh, in the limbo state, in, in between the media. And also Arduino controlled, so everything was automated, and nothing, uh, and it, it included minimal human interaction, actually. That had its own problems. It had only sen two, two types of sensors, and it only allowed one uh, stressor to be applied. And also, one growth chamber was not really that fancy, because if you do multiple uh, chambers, you can do multi-parameter 
growths and you can uh, compare multiple populations and that, that was not allowed in this. Uh, so that's why my work was to enable parallel growth cultures, so have multiple chambers, and there was absolutely no biochemical information as to what is happening inside the chamber during the evolution process. And that's why I added a set of wet chemistry sensors and also enable dynamic application of stressors in response to sensor parameters. And all these sensors were added. Along with cell density, which was already previously done, I added dissolved oxygen, electrical conductivity, pH, and ORP sensors to the system. Uh, adding sensors is not that easy because uh, you need to select a set of sensors and also have a set of uh, my, uh, the fluidics card needs to be completely changed so that it can accommodate the sensors. So this fluidics card, like you see, four chambers, four growth chambers. The cir circular one is a growth chamber, and the square ones are the, are the sensor chamber slots where sensors can be, uh, sensor probes could be inserted. And it's a six-layer design that was integrated, and it looked like this once it was put together. And this, these are the sensor circuits we bought off the shelf. Uh, these are basically called Atlas sensor stamps. They're really stamp size. They're really that small. And it's really cute. That's why they have a slide uh, in my presentation. And this is how it looks on the breadboard design. It's very compact. It's very efficient. And I'll show you the data. You'll be impressed. <laughs> in the process of adding sensors, uh, we found pretty good set microsensors. But the electrical conductivity sensor that we looked at was not really compact enough. Uh, so I designed a sensor, electrical, electrical conductivity sensor called the MECON, Microbio Electrical Conductivity Probe. It's basically, this is a 1 ml um, syringe, to be honest. And this is uh, a 0.8 millimeter nichrome wire. So these together make the electric, uh, electrical conductivity probes. And these were much less invasive as to what we could buy off the shelf. And this is a circuit that uh, controls it. And this is the data that shows that the commercial probe, EC probe, was uh, the, the Mekon probe was functioning exactly as well as the commercial probe in the, in the range that we were interested in. That's impressive data, FYI. <laughs> uh, so in the second generation device, all these parts in yellow added, uh, added more color to it. So for the sensing, instead of two parameters, it added four more, so the uh, total of six sensing parameters was enabled. And if you have a way to sense it, you have a way to environmentally control it. So environmental control system increased from two to seven, uh, two to six, sorry, two to six now. And fluid uh, mechanics was like inner chamber flow was allowed, the pump was still there. Uh, there was an exposure chamber and a sensor chamber added to accommodate the sensors. Uh, I like Raspberry Pi uh, along with Arduino. Arduino is a microprocessor. Uh, Raspberry Pi is an entire computer. It can control the entire system without failing really badly. And that constituted the second generation device that I developed. And this is important data because two reasons. One, it showed that I was awake for 24 hours. <laughs> Uh, and also, this was the data that proved to my advisor that I'm capable of graduating. <laughs> so the optical density data was collected over 24 hours. Every hour, I had to collect samples and put it through an optical density sensor and record what was the optical density. <clears throat> uh, dissolved oxygen is the most interesting part here. So the dissolved oxygen started at some point, and then it went to zero at approximately six hours. So after six hours, everything that happened was anaerobic. E. coli is not supposed to grow in an anaerobic environment, but it did. Granted, it did not have a really good growth rate as it had previously when it was aerobic, but it did have an increase in the growth rate even after six hours when oxygen was completely de depleted of it. Also, what's interesting is that at that switch between aerobic and anaerobic, the pH slope changed drastically. And there is one more slope change that I do not know. If there is a biochemist here. Please help me. <laughs> there is also electrical conductivity change at six hours. There was a dip in the small dip in the electrical conductivity, that, that gray line, that shows that there was a, a short-term stagnation in the exchange of ions between the media and the cells. 
But again, it regained that. It somehow learned to do that despite having no oxygen. And then there was, again, an increase in the uh, electrical conductivity. That means the ions were still produced and excreted out of the system. So that means this system can be used to eliminate the black box that I had spoke about initially. So basically, you have a system that can enable application of radiation stressor, temperature stressor, increased amount of salts or decreased amount of salts. Acid, uh, you can control the pH, and you can control the amount of oxygen. And all these stressors can be applied at the same time in combination or individually. And you will have a microbial population that has learned to grow despite these stressors. That means the intermediate black box, the changes in the protein structure, the metabolic pathways it took to adapt to that change, and the genetic sequences that were adapted can be studied with a device like this because it allows intermediate changes between a population that has no resistance to a population that has excellent resistance to all the stressors that you apply in, sta in small stages. Also, this kind of study can be used to help en en uh, enhance the ecosystem for cycling food, water, air, and waste. So basically, uh, no organism can survive on its own. Period. It needs other organisms to support it. So that, that includes humans. So if we want to have extended presence in space, if we want to travel really long distances and through space and time, then we need to have a set of microbes that will support us by providing uh, a cycling procedure for f a water, air, food, water, and waste. So that kind of study will invo uh, involve uh, stressors like extreme temperatures, limited nutrient supply, microgravity, and high radiation levels. And then those microbes can be actually sent with the astronauts to survive in a space flight mission control environment. For future work, uh, this device is intended to carry out the EE regimes that I just uh, mentioned with individual or combinational stressors, six stressors. Uh, employable stressors like with those uh, sensors can be like free ion concentration, osmotic ion stress, acidity, uh, metal ion presence, very nutrient availability like oxygen, thermal stressors, dissolved oxygen again, uh, and as more stressors that can be added, that means more sensors. There is no such thing as too many sensors in a system. So reactive oxygen species can be included, and very nutrient availability can be added to the system. Uh, also, this was a proof of concept, so we did it for one chamber system. So a multi-chamber system for intercultural comparisons and multi-population studies can be expanded. So the single chamber can be expanded to four or six, as per you like it, and have those studies uh, carried out. Um, extended system for growth and testing of other bacterial species. So this was done for E. coli. So any, uh, any system, any uh, organism that doesn't require like beyond 200 to 300 degrees te temperatures can be used, that will not melt the fluidic system and you can still use other bacterial species to carry out these processes. Questions? OK, I really love the potential for this hardware, but I have a ton of questions, okay. um, I, I, which I'll probably let other people ask questions. But, uh, so how do you guys deal with sterility uh, in this? Like, uh, How does the hardware handle Sterilization. Uh, so this was this was a microfluidic system. Mm -hmm. So basically, what we did is we assembled it in the presence of a flame, in okay. a Bunsen burner flame, and before that, it was autoclaved. This system can be autoclaved. In my presence itself, I autoclaved this at least seven to eight times, mm -hmm. and it still remained intact. All right, um, it's excellent, actually. And so, with the with the experimental evolution portion of it, if you wanted to do like very long, extended, uh, you know, thousand generation plus experiments. Um, do it, the fluidics pumps, I'm assuming, are, you know, moving media out and then putting it back in? Yes. Okay. So it's not like a chemostatic system? No. It's Have you guys like, looked at that? Oh, well, we avoided that kind of a system because because of the limitations in the fluidic paths that it allowed. Okay. Okay. So okay. this system was basically, uh, you can have a secondary chamber, which will store the first generation, uh, first generation culture. 
and then it can be made to reflow into the uh, fluid, if, into the fluidic system, and it has the ports for it. Okay, very cool. I'll have to talk to you. Sure, definitely. Yes. Uh, very cool stuff. I was wondering if you could comment on advantages of your microfluidic system over larger things like doing this in a fermenter. Uh, if you have a larger system, the way I would see it is like the sterilization will be harder. And also, uh, if the system is smaller, you can see the growth in a very short amount of time. And if the system is really large, uh, it would actually simplify the application of sensors. But that also means that you need to have a really robust agitation system to keep the media uh, homogenous throughout the chamber, which is why we switch to smaller and smaller chambers so that there's not much of magnetic, magnetic uh, inference into the interference into it. Hey, Hi. Um, I wonder if you think you can use this system to study consortia of different species living together, either by differentiating them with different uh, chromophoric probes, for example, while they're growing, or any, by an, any other means which necessitates some another form of detection, like, I don't know, microscopy or different wavelengths uh, and such. So you want to add some kind of an imaging system into this? Is that what, you, what you're asking? Yeah, because you need to, if you want to grow different species together, you need to track all these parameters for every other species that's living. So I was wondering if, if you think this could be done in a very efficient way. So the sensor parameters data that I showed was actually real time. So during the growth of E. coli, those parameters were recorded. So if you want individual parameters over a duration of time for multiple species, there has to be some kind of chemical uh, barrier between those systems. So you can actually isolate the sensor parameters. Okay, if but, I'm but, understanding but your question right. But it's not living together in a solution. It's like you need to separate them. and. If you put them together in a solution, you will get the resultant uh, yeah, yeah. media okay. chem chemistry and not the individual chemistries that you wanted. OK. <laughs> Thank you.